Hello, everyone. Welcome. Greg, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first installment of the Met Opera's HD Live in Schools Opera Book Club for the 2022-2023 year. Uh, my name is Nick Reinhardt. I'm the content manager for education at the Met Opera. And we are starting off this year with a bang, uh, discussing Michael Cunningham's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Hours alongside what has been dubbed by multiple sources, the opera event of the year, uh, the world premiere staging of Kevin Putz and Greg Pierce's opera, The Hours. So we're so excited to be joined by students um, and teachers from HD Live and schools, partner districts who are both watching this live and also will be watching a recording of it later, um, and to welcome special guest, Greg Pierce. So Greg, thank you so much for being with us today. Pleasure. Um, before we get into The Hours proper, um, and we have a lot to talk about. I want to emphasize, again, how lucky we are to have Greg Pierce in our company. Uh, Greg is not just a triple threat. He's actually a quadruple threat, if he doesn't mind me saying. Um, he's written fiction, uh, plays for the stage, lyrics for musicals, and, of course, libretti for several operas. His stage works include Slow Girl, the inaugural play of Lincoln, Center's, uh, Lincoln Center Theater's Claire Tao Theater, Her Requiem, a Lincoln Center Theater Commission, Cardinal, commissioned and produced by Second Stage Theater, and The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle, co-written with Stephen Earnhardt and premiered at the Edinburgh uh, International Festival. His musical works include The Landing and Kid Victory with music by John Candler, and The Quarry with music by his brother, Randall Pierce, which must have been either very fun or very challenging. It was fun. Uh, Fellow Travels, an opera with composer, composer Gregory Pierce, uh, premiered at Cincinnati Opera and has been presented by the Prototype Festival, the Lyric Opera of Chicago, and Minnesota Opera. So uh, the way this conversation is going to go is I'm going to ask Greg a few opening questions to get us started, and then we'll turn to some questions submitted from students in our HD Live in Schools program. Sound good? Sounds great. OK, so first things first, I just want to do a vibe check. The hours opened last week. I've had the opportunity to see it one and a half times, I would say. Um, the anticipation has been tremendous. The press coverage has been tremendous. The lead up has been several years in the making. What does it feel like on your end to finally see the opera come to life? It feels incredible. I mean, it was a very long process for us, for me and um, for the composer, Kevin Putz. Um, it was four, four plus years. And a lot of that time, it was just us. We were working very closely with um, the dramaturg, Paul Cremo, who was helping us sort of track the story and making sure everything made sense. But it was... Um, it was really us, you know, in a room or because of the pandemic in separate rooms, kind of working by phone and everything. Um, so then in the last six weeks before opening, that's when all the elements came together. A lot of people had been working separately, but we hadn't seen that work. You know, singers preparing individually, dancers. We'd seen some of the dance dance workshop. Um, but it was just incredible. All these people who had doing, uh, been doing all this um, amazing work suddenly you know brought it all together and it was this massive thing suddenly that was out of our hands and because i'm used because i'm primarily a playwright and i'm used to being able to like once we get into rehearsal i can trim scenes i can swap scenes out if if a scene if we if i need another scene in there i could mm -hmm. go ahead like that um really can't do that in opera so it was much more you know if i uh, if i if i needed to write a new line kevin would have to like orchestrate that for you know a million instrumentalists so um that wasn't really going to happen we did make a couple of a couple of little changes um here and there but it, it really i found for for me for a librettist um you have to sort of get used to that like do everything you need to do you know really before rehearsal starts and then and then be there to answer questions and be a kind of a guide and keep an eye on the story. But yeah, it's been exciting. Yeah, so that actually connects to another question um, I'm going to ask, which also came from one of our students. Um, so as we've mentioned, you've written fiction plays, lyrics for musicals, libretti for several operas. A libretto is a very strange kind of form. Um, what makes a libretto distinct from, say, a play? Um, and how does that inform your approach to crafting li the libretto as opposed to doing a stage play? Um, and this is also something that one of our students, Lainey Tai, was asking, um, namely, what is the difference between executing a play versus an opera? And you just mentioned one with a play, you can make cuts on the fly, write a new scene on the fly with an opera, not so much. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, major differences. Um, one for me is when I write a play, it's really coming from me. It's really what I want to do. So if I want to make the lines longer, if I want to, 
you know, bring a certain uh, um, character forward or um, expand the role. That, it's all sort of coming from me. Um, opera is really, obviously, it's a, it's a musical art form, you know, so all of those early conversations were really not like, what do I want to do? What do I want my libretto? It's what does Kevin want to do? What do we want to do together? But what kind of a thing? I mean, Kevin, uh, Kevin puts the composer came to me with this project and said, you know, I, I would like to write an, uh, I want, I'm going to write this opera for the Met. It's going to be big, you know, it's going to be a big orchestra. There's going to be um, uh, a huge chorus. So we have to figure out a way if you want to do this to, to, um, to make this work musically. So, so we immediately started talking about like, what are the, um, what are the musical possibilities? So we have three storylines, right? We have Laura, Clarissa and Virginia. And um, immediately there were opportunities to do duets, trios, arias, uh, with a great big chorus, you know, how does that um, intersect with this, the storylines? So we were talking um, musically first, and mm -hmm. sort of story second. So um, uh, now that we, how, how do we, how do we tell the story in a way that allows Kevin to do what he wants to do musically? Which is a totally different conversation than anything I've had in the theater before. It's fascinating. It's much more of a jigsaw a jigsaw puzzle. You yeah, know, you have to you have to factor in a lot of things. Almost like reverse engineering it. Like you have to set up limitations and constraints first, and then you can sort of fill in the blanks. That's exactly right, and and that's really exciting to me. I mean, it's, it it makes it more of a challenge, but also mm -hmm. um, for for those of you who are also writers um, or kind of make anything, you know that you know you put a lot of times you put the constraints in place. And suddenly mm -hmm. things open up, and you think like, okay, I need a chorus to be able to do this after this character. Uh, after this, I don't want to ruin too many things in the novel if, they, if mm -hmm. they haven't read it yet. But after something happens to this character and say the chorus wants to react in a really big way, um, what do we need them to to do? And then, uh, yeah. So it's it, it has been a challenge, but I, I just think working in every, um, in all these different media, there's there's a central sort of storytelling principles. You know, you, people can't be bored and they can't be confused. Right. Those are two right. big ones, and that those are just across across all the um, of the media. But um, but then when you really get into the specifics, and uh, it's it's exciting to figure out what can what can opera do that a play can't. Right, and one of the things you've sort of already um, dealt with a little bit is you know one thing possibly that an opera can do is you know show characters reacting simultaneously or having seen simultaneously that in a novel you can't really do and in a film you can do but it's much um i don't want to say clumsier but it's 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 not the same as having two characters on stage next to each other right right i guess you could do like split screen in a film but right not screen. quite as smooth yeah, yeah. Right. right so one thing you know we talk a lot about in opera and especially in the hd live in schools program is source text Almost, you know, opera is largely based on adaptation. It's rare that you have, you know, an original story. Um, but you had an especially, I would think, difficult job. Maybe this made it easier, which is that there's sort of two source texts. There's the novel, The Hours, of course, but then there's also the film, um, which is just as well known, if not more well known than the novel, um, that it was award winning. And then you have the screenplay, which is closer to a dramatic kind of text than a novel is. Um, so this is a question that comes from me as well as two of our students, Nora and Ellis in Bangor, Maine, which is um, how do you navigate these multiple source texts that people already know before coming to the opera? Um, and how do you maintain your own creative voice or perspective when you already have um, these other sources sort of influencing the creation of the work? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so I, I always wanna go to the source. In mm -hmm. Uh, before I go to somebody else's adaptation, so okay. I thought the the movie was um, wonderful, you know, and that's a that's a terrific screenplay, of course. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a it would have been too confusing to me to try to really take these things equally and then say like, oh, but we have our third way of doing it. So what do I? And what I have found with I've done a bunch of adaptations before from novels, and um, mm -hmm. what I found is you you can't really. Uh, pick and choose your favorite pieces from a lot of different things and cobble them together and make that and think that that's going to be a coherent story. So I, I've actually used the same process for, for every um, adaptation. I did a, this opera, Fellow Travelers, and I did mm -hmm. uh, Murakami's The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle. And for, right. for both of those, um, 
I read the original, I read the novel a lot, talked to the composer or my collaborators, director um, about the novel. Uh, and then we talked about, you know, our favorite, our favorite, uh, our favorite characters, our favorite parts, what themes, what, what kind of stuff we wanted to include, and then put the novel aside um, mm -hmm. for, a, for a little bit of time um, and then start fresh. And because when I start writing a libretto, the libretto has to exist for people at the Met who haven't seen the movie and haven't read the book. It has to exist for them. And for me, the only way to make sure that it's its own um, cohesive pro um, uh, piece that's not confusing and not boring um, it is to just is to write it on my own. And then in terms of like my own voice coming through, I, I don't even think about that. You know, I have mm -hmm. to just have faith that if I'm going to write it, my voice is going to come through. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, sometimes with writing, I find it's just best to not um, to just not think too much about certain things like that. You know, is this original enough? How close is it to the I just we just try to sort of do the best job we can um, and then just hope that those things that it'll feel like a new thing, that it'll feel original and not really consciously say, oh, well, Michael Cunningham did this. So let's not do that. Let's you know, we just have to tell the tell the story. Right. So it's interesting because it's like there's utmost concentration on the source, but to such an extent that it almost sort of falls away, that it's not about a, a totally faithful adaptation of the novel as much as it is um, creating something that aspires to do the same kind of work as that novel. Does that make yes, sense? Yes, exactly. Right? And it always goes through this. I always go through the same sort of like emotional kind of journey where I've, I've like done, done the thing and then we get years away and then I haven't read the hours Michael's novel in years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'm looking at this thing on stage and thinking like, did I miss the entire point? Because I've forgotten what it was I left out. I forgot. I've been so in this world. And I think, what if I've done this thing? It happens every for every single project. And I think like, what if I'm, what if I'm too far away? And yeah. then when I go back to the source, like after the opening or something, I haven't actually done it yet with the hours. I should with the novel. But um, I go back and, and it's, it's closer than I think. You know, mm -hmm. there are arias in our opera that um, that I've forgotten, that I really took a, a line of Michael Cunningham's or like an impulse that he had and really expanded on something that was already there. Um, you know, I just forgot because it feels so much like ours because, our, not ours, but- Right. Our, mine and Kevin's. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think you had an especially daunting task in doing this libretto and this opera, not only because you have Michael Cunningham's book sort of looming, but then you also, of course, have um, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, which is historically an even more important, more famous novel that more people are going to know about and have read before coming to the show. Um, it's also the novel is kind of like the prime mover in the work. It's the basic precondition for everything that comes after it. Um, so how much did you think about Virginia Woolf as a writer? Um, how much uh, research did you do on her? How much of Mrs. Dalloway did you incorporate into the opera itself? Um, and this is also a question that comes from Emily and Genevieve, two of our students, which is, you know, how do you, how much of Wolf makes it into the libretto or how much is she a consideration, not just as a character, but as a literary figure? Yeah, um, yeah, great. Um, more than I thought would happen. I mean, I read the novel mm -hmm. a lot and then read Mrs. Dalloway a lot. And because that thing that we were just talking about, um, the simultaneous storytelling, we have mm -hmm. moments in the opera um, where, where Virginia is writing and Laura is reading. And they, this, this, they're, they're the opening line. What's that? When uh, Virginia is writing the opening line and Laura's reading it. The opening line and then yeah. throughout the opera, just little other other points when Laura's in her hotel room and Virginia mm -hmm. there. Um, so we did it because of that. And because we wanted to have text to keep their stories going, um, we ended up incorporating more, more text from Virginia. So I did a lot of um, Mrs. Dalloway research. Uh, did, uh, there's a great book called A Writer's Diary, which is like a mm -hmm. kind of compilation of Virginia's um, diaries, but specifically about writing and writing Mrs. Dalloway and her other novels. Uh, and that was, that was really helpful because um, you not only get, uh, it gives you an insight into the, her process, you know, and, and how, how she went about it, but also how she's putting words together while writing about her process. And so even if we didn't sort of use those words exactly um, in, the, in our opera, we have a lot of Virginia talking about how difficult it is to write a novel. 
And so right. to actually be able to read in her journal the kinds of adjectives she was using, the kinds of she, you know, she can write in a very sort of fragmented, stringing together adjectives, almost po prose poetry sort of way. So it, yeah. it was helpful to be able to sort of mimic that. Um, we also used uh, Leonard Wolf, her husband's mm -hmm. uh, diaries, which were oh, awesome. really interesting because he studies her and studies her um, her uh, mental state and progress of her novels. And he's also her husband and mm -hmm. her uh, you know editor and all these has all these different roles in her life. So yeah, those are our real source or uh, research materials. Yeah, we're going to spend more time talking about Virginia Woolf next week. Um, we're talking with the curator from the New York Public Library's uh, new exhibit on her. Okay. Um, but it's interesting to note that you're dealing not just with Mrs. Dalloway, but with her journals and diaries and also Leonard Wolf's diaries. So there's yeah. multiple bodies of writing from Wolf that are sort of coming into play in some way. Yeah. Um, I imagine one of the many difficulties of writing a libretto um, is that they're often quite short, probably surprisingly short, even though operas are very long. Yeah. Um, so I imagine that there's lots of stuff that got sort of left on the cutting room floor, maybe mm -hmm. scenes that were taken out. Um, for example, there's an, a character in the novel and the movie, Clarissa Vaughn's daughter, who does not appear in the opera. So I wonder, you know, how do you make these decisions to sort of to include or not, you know, to cut or not to cut? Um, how do you decide what gets included and what has to sort of be trimmed? Um, and when in the process do you make these decisions? Um, and Naomi Levitt from Bangor, Maine also had a similar question, which is how do you know when you have to include something and how do you know when it can go, even if you want it to stay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for me, it's about, um, it's about really being clear about who, what the, whose story it is, what, what are mm -hmm. the primary um, characters and what's the perspective. So here we have three different perspectives. We have Clarissa who kind of starts us off. And then we have, um, next we have Virginia Woolf. Um, and then we have Laura. And in terms of the de decisions about the secondary characters, the, the sort of supporting cast all around them, mm -hmm. um, it was all about which people bring out the aspects of the main characters that we that we want, that we need mm -hmm. in order to tell this story. So um, yeah, there are tons of characters in uh, that just make brief appearances in, in Michael Cunningham's novel. Um, and since we didn't have that kind of space um, and the luxury to do that, it, it, it just felt like, okay, so if, if Clarissa's um, partner, Sally, is bringing out um, this part of her, this sort of irritated part, what have I done with my life? Um, she, you know, this, this party is going to be great, but, but this person says maybe it's not going to be, that's like all irritated. Right. So we have sort of that part of her. Um, and who else can we include um, that's going to um, bring out something else? So like Barbara in the flower shop, who right. has to go and buy flowers for Richard's party tonight, and she, she encounters Barbara. Um, and that for us turns into a real sort of fantasy. Um, instead, you know, it's, what if I didn't have my old life with Sally? Mm -hmm. What if I could just actually, you know, spend the entire day in this flower shop um, with this person who's um, so lovely? Um, so, uh, yeah, and then, and then sort of just using that flower shop example again, I mean, in, in terms of your, your um, cutting room, floor or comment, which is, which mm -hmm. is true. There's a, a ton of stuff um, unfolding. One of them was that scene, which is in the opera, we wrote uh, a, a long scene. I wrote a long scene between Clarissa and Barbara in the flower shop. And it was sort of naturalistic. They were sort of just mm -hmm. singing. Um, and then we thought, is there a more operatic way to do this? Um, so we actually ended up cutting all of Barbara's material leaving Clarissa's material and then just giving Barbara names of flowers. That was it. Oh, that was right. Um, and then finding an interesting way for her to, um, to sing those. And Kevin came up with the idea of a, um, a casting a, uh, a coloratura and having mm -hmm. a Mo Mozart, like a queen of the night kind of, right. kind of thing to just tell the story musically. So, right. Um, so a final question before we, we move to some uh, specific student questions, and this one is not <laughs> meant to induce any feelings of regret, um, but whenever I work on something, when I see it later, when I see it done, when I see it in print, I always think I could do it over, I could do it better, always, um, always. give me another shot at it, yeah. that one sentence, yeah, yeah. everybody's, it's not right, and everybody's going to know it. Um, having seen the show now, 
um, a few times and seen it sort of take on a life of its own. Are there any moments from the opera that you revisit and think we could have done X, Y, and Z differently? Or, or is it just nice to have it off your plate? Both. It's nice, okay. to have it, it's nice to have it in the world and there's always things. And every time I go to, it's hard. It's hard going to the shows. I love it. I love it. But mm -hmm. um, uh, like, for instance, this last show that I went to, um, uh, you know, in the for the past four years, I've been working really hard to make sure that the piece is coherent, but the voices within them are very distinct. So the three main characters, their voices, that, that, they, that, that Virginia speaks like a Virginia Woolf who lives in 1923 in England and is writing Mrs. Dalloway. And um, so, uh, yeah, there, there were times where I would um, listen to these three characters and there would be a certain sentence construction between two of them that are a little bit more um, like a habit of mine or something that sort of just sounds good to my ear. And I would, I, I, and I would think like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I wish, you know, that could be a little bit different. But yeah. At the same time, I couldn't think of a rewrite, you know? So I thought like, oh, That's maybe good. it's okay. Maybe it's a, you know, the, because these three characters in the novel are all Michael Cunningham's voice as he writes these three characters. And that's what makes it great. You right. know, so there is a certain amount of like, you just got to trust that, you know, it's our voice. We're telling the story. It's a, it's a Virginia Woolf. It's Michael Cunningham's Virginia Woolf as told by Greg Pierce and Kevin Putz. That's what it is. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I remember uh, when you're in grad school, they always say a, a, a good dissertation is a done dissertation. Um, and I'm sure you might also say a good opera is a done opera, although maybe that's a little too too simple. We are definitely done with it. I mean, <laughs> we are. Yeah, it's, ni it's nice. We're really, really proud of it and uh, and happy to be moving on. Yeah, deadli deadlines are our are, are friends. Yeah. Um, so I want to turn now to some, some questions that came in from students. Great. Um, this first one is from, oh, that's the wrong banner. There we are, from Sierra and Bangor, who asks, what does a successful piece of work look like to you? Either one that you've created um, or one that you've seen. What does a good or successful production look like? Or maybe not a production, just a, a work. A work. Yeah, that's a great question, Sierra. That's something I've been thinking about. Um, uh, I've been reading this amazing novel right now, 2666 by Roberto mm -hmm. Bolaño, which yep. is a huge fat novel. And I'm just at the beginning, but I'm already like, this is a great novel. This is a great work because I'm totally transported and that he has just created a world. This I'm, I'm, I'm in a different world. It's related to a world I know, but um, I'm already, even though I'm only like 40 pages in, I'm already starting to see like the logic of this world of a different world. And it's so exciting to me that I'm like stepping onto a different planet and mm -hmm. really excited to like figure out how all of this works, how the characters relate to each other and, um, and just sort of what the, what the landscape is there. And so I think when I go to a play or I go to an opera and I really love it and I think it's successful, um, I, I leave feeling like that was just, I didn't know that planet existed. And I was like, so happy to be walking around on that, you know, and then, then you walk out into the world and you're like, Oh, wow. I, my, my world is different now because I saw that. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that's, that stays with you or not, you know, uh, there are things that I, you know, have stayed with me for 25 years because I thought they were so extraordinary, but I think that's, that's my idea of what's successful. Great. So this is a question from True in Atlanta, who asked when developing the libretto for the hours, which character was the greatest challenge to write? And I'll say we actually had several students from across the country ask a, a similar version of this question. You have these three iconic characters, three sort of iconic performers, which presents the greatest challenge? Virginia presented the greatest challenge because, okay. um, because she was a real person and you want to do that justice and you also there are recordings you can go on, you can you can go online and find recordings of the way that virginia spoke and she spoke mm -hmm. in really long fancy sentences which is terrible for opera right yeah. because you can't have somebody sing um a sentence that's 48 words long because then by the time you you get to the end of it people people don't understand the sentence so i, mm -hmm. I really i really need shorter phrases singable lines um, not too many adjectives. Um, and so that was a tricky one to write. I had to kind of come up with a new way for Virginia to speak, but have it still, 
you know, hopefully sort of capture in the essence of Virginia while she's interacting with her husband or, or whoever. Um, I suspected she would be the most difficult one, but I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that I was right. Um, this is a question Can from- I just say The easiest one was Laura Brown. Okay. That was because I, I, I don't know why exactly. It, it's just, I love that storyline. I love all the storylines, but, um, and there was stuff that my, uh, Michael, Michael Cunningham just wrote these scenes so beautifully when she interacts with her neighbor. I mean, some of that stuff mm -hmm. we literally just set to music. We were like, this scene is so gorgeous and the, her yeah. voice is so distinctive. That was easy. Yeah. I wonder if that has to do with the fact that I think Michael Cunningham partly based Laura Brown off of his own mother, um, arguably, um, or he saw his own mother as this kind of suburban housewife type. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder if it's this sort of personal connection that made those scenes flow in a particular way. But maybe I'm, I'm reading yeah, I mean, too much into it. He's just such a wonderful writer. He can just do that, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so this is a question from Leah in Atlanta. What musical genres influence your writing? Um, and I think this is especially an interesting question, even though students haven't seen the opera yet, because there are multiple musical styles happening. Um, yeah. When each of the characters is introduced, Clarissa is in this sort of New York, not exactly jazzy, but it's, it's, um, it's very hectic and lively, and you feel like you're in a city surrounded by people. And then Laura Brown's music is very cinematic, sort of old Hollywood. Um, so how do those different musical styles change the way that you write? Mm. I mean, I came to opera kind of late. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I listen to opera um, now some, but I always, I listen to a lot of hip hop. I listen to a lot mm -hmm. of um, indie rock when I was going, I really was in high school in the nineties and these mm -hmm. bands like the Pixies and Pavement and all these bands. And they were, uh, you know, there were all these really weird, you know, surreal kind of lyrics um, that really influenced me a lot. So even though I've been writing musicals and opera, I think primarily in terms of words for me and, and music, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really not that. I mean, I, I love Slick Rick, the rapper. Okay. Um, he's he's um, one of my heroes. Um, yeah, this band Pavement, I really love. Mm -hmm. And then let's see, I, I don't know, I've gone through just a, a lot of sort of um, musical f phases, but the more I've been thinking about influences and what I really kind of continually come back to, um, it's really not classical music, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. Right now I'm writing a, a folk rock musical with a college friend of mine, and that's a lot of fun. It's just a genre I don't know as much about. So I just sort of like doing all of it. Yeah, I don't know how many of our students will know Slick Rick, but I encourage them all to, yeah. <laughs> to go look it up. Um, the 90s was the best decade for music, so um, lots to learn there. Um, a final question um, we have from Caroline in Bangor, Maine, which is, how is the hours different from other operas that you've worked on previously? Um, and maybe different from other projects that you're working on now or that you have sort of in the pipeline, but what makes this distinct? I haven't done a lot of operas. I've only done this opera, Fellow Travelers, and then a composer, okay. Nico Muley and I did um, a short film opera called The Glitch. Um, so I don't have okay. a ton of experience, um, stuff to compare it to, but this is different because this is just bigger. This is a much bigger scale, uh, everything. So thinking about um, this part of the story, what if this is told through dance? What if this is told through, you know, 55 chorus members? What if this is a whole musical interlude, which we can make really long because we have this incredible, you know, um, orchestra. Um, there were just a lot of other uh, storytelling, um, uh, the ways of telling story that were just available to us, you know, mm -hmm. methods. Um, so we, we had a lot more decisions to make. Um, and we we had the luxury of using those, and we also didn't want we also didn't want to do too much, you know. So so it's the idea of um, when you have all this stuff available to you, you know, how do you use it in the most most eff effective way? Right. Sometimes less is more. Sometimes more is more. But you know, you don't want to use every every everything in the spice rack, and then everything just sort of tastes messy, right? That's it. That's it. The big surprise to me was the dance because I love this um, choreographer, Annie B. Parson, who did our mm -hmm. choreography and um, just how much of the storytelling and the atmosphere uh, comes through dance. I mean, I didn't, before I met her and before I saw the dancers, I didn't, I didn't know how dance would be incorporated into the hours. You know, I read the book and thought it doesn't seem like a dancey book. Um, yeah. And then uh, suddenly all this, all this gorgeous stuff is coming and it's, she's created this dream world, which is really sort of essential to our telling of the story. Great. 
Um, well, thank you so much, Greg, for joining us, for kicking off um, this year's book club. Um, thank you for the hours. I've had the pleasure to see it. It was a wonderful experience just even to be in the Opera House and to be around that many people that are excited about it. Um, it, it is the talk of the town, and I'm sure our students will be thrilled to see it a week from this Saturday um, on December 10th. Um, so please join me, everyone uh, who's with us and who is watching this in the future, in thanking Greg Pierce once again uh, for joining us. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everybody. It's been a pleasure.